All right, you're recording. Hi, sister. I'm just going to give you a quick review of what I show on the Octahoop so you know what to do so you're not stressed out. And um, you may not know about these things. And we have some people watching, but they won't mind learning in a, in a candid way, I don't think. So what I do is I show them how light they are because all the other rings in the industry are, are heavy. You don't need to pan in or anything. I was trying to pan out so she could see them. Okay, good. And so this, what's important is to show that this has an uneven surface so that it doesn't stick to the sewing machine surface. So it glides real easy and usually our fabrics stick to the surface and that causes puckers on the back of the quilt. This prevents that from happening. We have a uh, a folder of different printed stabilite stick and rents for you to show the customers at the show. So you'll be able to embroider right through this doing free motion embroidery holding on to a little peg so it feels like it's a crayon in your hand. It's important to note that when we write we usually have to push down on the pin. In order to push down you must also squeeze. And by squeezing and pushing down when you write everybody's finger is crooked. So if everybody puts their finger up, you'll note that everybody in the entire group cavity will have a crooked finger and this helps them realize they don't have arthritis, but it's just physiology and the act of pushing causes your body to deform. And when we sit like this, we are also deforming our neck and it causes the vertebrae to fuse together. It's a permanent injury to your body. So when we work with a free motion foot, the foot locks the view of the item that you're trying to embroider, forcing you to kind of sit down. And in order to manipulate a quilt, for instance, around a foot, when you're trying to follow around a pattern, they have to, you can pull back, they have to actually lean their head around like this in order to follow as you're probably finding out because I had her, she's learning how to quilt without having done it much before. And so she's, I told her to do everything the way everyone else teaches so she learns what the struggles you go through. Palms down is physically really bad for you. It causes a shortening of the tendons and muscles across the tops of the hands, putting you at risk of corporal tunnel and other injuries to the hands. So pushing down is bad not only for your hands, but also all the muscle groups up in your hand. Pushing down, leaning down like this causes, uh, well, everybody understands what it causes because they've been hurt. The first thing that we do with it, with it when I demonstrate is show them how to use the hoops for embroidery. I have this sample of how we used to do it. So it has a wooden frame and you insert the stabilizer into the frame and we used to do this because you can't embroider directly on a garment without stretching it into the hoop and that causes the garment to distort and that's why dad invented the stick it all in the first place. So then I talk about the stick it all. And my father, her father, invented this stabilizer that sticks to the back of the frame. And you're welcome to touch it and feel how when you slide your hands left to right, you don't feel any stick at all, but when you push on it, it sticks. This is actually a fabric, not a paper. All the other companies thought my father was using paper. You're welcome to join us. The camera will only be on me, so you're welcome to, to sit. The um, stabilizer is designed to stick to the back of our frames only. The back of the frame is a surface that has an uneven surface, which is like looking at your keyboard on your computer, you may not notice that all the surfaces around the keys are that type of surface. They're un uneven, and that makes your, your hands slide easier over the surface. And then all of the keys on the keyboard are flat surface, making your fingers stick better to it. It's also true on all your telephones, even some of your smartphones are like that. So basically, this, all the science is figured into this. An octagon is a perfect mathematic shape. And um, so basically the octagons work on the laws of physics. They use resistance. We, we actually go into psychology and how the brain functions. We have you switch from left hemisphere of the brain to the right hemisphere of the brain by tricking your brain into thinking that it's doing something else, then the left brain gets all frustrated and it lets you release in your right. It's similar to a technique or a process taught in college for drawing, and they use a process called drawing on the right side of the brain. 
where they have you take a picture, <clears throat> like a black and white picture of a tennis shoe, and flip it upside down. And then they tell you not to draw the shoe, but just draw the dart that you see. And then people who could only draw stick figures before can suddenly draw this shoe. They flip it over and they're shocked that they actually drew a shoe. So this is really fun. You actually go into your right brain and you don't even know you've done it because you're no longer thinking and analyzing, which is what the left side does. You're just experiencing, which is like when you drive for five miles and you can't even remember how you got where you were. It kind of makes you scared, doesn't it? So you're going to feel an odd experience when you work with these. Because we, we use this, what seems like a pen, the left brain starts to analyze this and it goes, well, there's nothing coming out of that tip. So when you're steering with this, it soon realizes that that has, is not why the thread is actually on the stabilizer or on the fabric. It's the needle that makes the thread get on the fabric. But the needle is not moving either because we're going to use just a straight stitch to do free motion embroidery and quilting. The only time I use a zigzag is when I'm doing a monogram, which is also covered on the instructional DVD that comes with the Octavia kit. And you probably haven't seen these before. They're only about three and a half years old. They will be featured in this holiday season's boat pattern magazine. They contacted us and let us know they're doing a bio on it. So you can just unthread it. Anyway. So the mathematics of an octagon is that all sides or all corners are identical in shape. The outer side and the inside are the same mathematics of every corner on that octagon, but it's also the same mathematics as this one and this one, which means that the inside corners of these meet and match together, even though they're significantly smaller than one another. And what that means is you can now make them move as one, even though there are two pieces that don't even fit together. So when we quilt, we're going to use two frames at once and just grab the corner and bring them into each other. And that allows you to move them. So as we embroider, you can also embroider through the stick and rinse stabilizer, which is a water-soluble adhesive stabilizer that I invented. And it also is used for removing all bias out of all fabric. So if you want to hem a t-shirt, you can use this to, to go across your t-shirt, then you cut the fabric and that allows you to fold it under and hem it. You can sew right through the adhesive and through our other adhesive, which is on this. Here it is. That's our stick and roots. And you can embroider anything from a photograph of your favorite pet to uh, even Disney designs fully legally. You just cannot, people never want to sit behind the camera. That's why I wanted to do this early. <laughs> people are always asking us to film the show. I'm like, no one sits, and I need that interaction. Uh, this is the the way you handle figuring out where to print something. So you go on to Google, you, you can search for Thumper, and then all these pictures of Thumper come up, and you right click on one of the images, and then you view image as, and then it pops up on your screen. Then you write top upside down on your blank piece of paper, put it through your printer that way. It prints out either this side or that side, depending on your printer. Then you tape our blank stabilizer over it, put it back to the printer, and now you have a sticker that you can embroider through. And this is completely legal if you're not going to sell that shirt. So you want to give it away or keep it for yourself, you can actually do that. But if you have an embroidery machine, you cannot legally digitize it. I like that into your computer, you're actually breaking the law. So this is a loophole in the creative process where we can do any embroidery we want as long as we don't sell it or try to profit from it. The embroidery process normally is done with both hands on the frame and there's usually a foot that you're trying to look under with this, there's no foot at all. When you have an embroidery machine, your embroidery machine has a computer program for each design and what that does is each design, when you hold on the machine, you put your bracket on the machine, when the embroidery hoop moves up, there's a different tension setting than when it moves down. And another tension setting all together when it moves diagonally up, another different setting when it moves diagonally back. And that has to do with the anatomy of the needle, so that when the hoop's moving, it's not causing the needle to bend. And this is something that you aren't aware of that happens in an embroidery machine, but on a regular machine, we don't have the ability to adjust tension. So this is why we were never able to embroider directly on a garment before, like this, just letting our fabric lay down on a regular machine until the octave.
So this is a revolutionary new method of doing embroidery where you actually feel as though you're just drawing. And you don't have to worry about distorting any fabric and you don't need an embroidery machine. I have to find my little things. So we're going to use just a regular straight stitch and the only instruction is to lower your tension one number less than normal. And then you just start coloring. This is our stick and run stabilizer and that's why all these hearts are the same. So if you can come up with a design and print it out a bunch of times on a piece of paper, make a bunch of stickers, stick them onto a bunch of different shirts, you have your own clothing line without having to get an embroidery machine. You can also use coloring books to transfer designs onto fabric as my mother did on this Valentine quilt that you see up here. The Valentine quilt was done by taking pages out of a coloring book. She tore them all out, taped them on a sliding glass door. Then she took a piece of cotton broadcloth and taped it above that, used a charcoal pencil and traced around the designs and then used the colors that were on the coloring book to tell her what colors to use. Mm -hmm. What you can go ahead and point it to the thing. The blouse on the left, you see how there's a sticker on the left and then there's no sticker on the right? So all you do is trace right through the design and then the sticker tears away and rinses away, exposing just the thread that you put on the garment. So that is just like tracing mm -hmm. through your uh, sticker. And this is how this was done also. This is mm -hmm. the dragonfly design. You can watch this from start to finish on our, our YouTube channel, which is available also for you for free. We have a lot of different videos on there. I have cards and I'm trying to find them, but I have yet to find them. That's okay, you're in my favorites. <laughs> oh, thanks. So on the bottom of the card is the uh, site where you can actually watch a machine like this be painted from start to finish in only four and a half minutes. We use the sticker rinse on the DVD uh, so that you can learn how to use it. Now I'm going to show the quilting process because this is the, uh, the more frustrating and most physically difficult technique. When I invented this, I knew my customers well enough to know that they consider reading the instructions as step number two. So, I took this and I decided to use two different battings and pretend like I didn't know anything using opposite types of fabrics that don't go together at all. And then I decided to break every rule in quilting. I started on the end. And I worked up and down in a zigzag pattern all the way around in a circle and ended in the middle and despite no, no feed dogs being lowered and no foot and doing absolutely nothing right, there's not a single pucker to be found on the front or the back. Now normally you would have puckers on the back, especially with the other frames that are heavy and weighted because they cause the fabrics to push on the smooth surface of your machine that's sticky. If you can't see mistakes on this, it's because it's not yours, just like you may not have noticed I have a mole on my face. I know it because it's always there every morning. I try to cover it up. And there are moles all over us. They're just not, they're not yours. There's a mole, there's a mole. And uh, so when you quilt, try to think of that. People are going to look at your overall design, not find your little mistakes. And if they do, well, don't let them look at your stuff. <laughs> now, when we started quilting, it's actually a really young art form. It started in the 70s. We didn't start doing free motion machine quilting until the 70s. All of your embroidery or quilting before that was done usually hand tying off the quilts, but we discovered that once you put a quilt on the bed and someone actually sat on the bed, since all fabrics have a bias, the batting inside tears. And it's pretty devastating if you haven't known this before. But this is what really happens inside your quilt. These were only one year ago, all quarter inch thick. These are all 100% natural battings, and this is why I tell you not to use them. Try not, not to hurt batting companies, but help you, because you're my student, not them, and I want to make sure you're happy with me. So this is 100% cotton, and I'm not, I haven't let anybody touch it. I've been folding it up, and only one year old, I, I brought it last year this show. So it's been to, um, I don't know how many shows I do, more than I should. <laughs> so you can see all of the highs and lows in the batting, and it hasn't been sat on. It's been folded up in a dark area for a whole year, and this is what really happens inside your quilt. So it starts out quarter inch thick. This is quarter inch thick. There, now it's barely even thick. This is why we stopped using cotton batting in the past. 
And unfortunately, when you get an educator, they don't necessarily have a background in the sewing industry. Like Carol Ann Wall, for instance. She has launched a class called Craftsy on Craftsy.com called Stupendous Stitching. Using only one of our 88 techniques, she's developed an entire company and written a book and has a class all on one technique of our 88 techniques, using our curls and piping foot. And she used terminology wrong throughout the book. She's come up and apologized to me a couple times. She we joke about it now. And it really doesn't matter because what happens is educators who write a book and they're teaching you their pattern, the way they did it, they don't necessarily have a background in the sewing industry. I do. I'm rooted in the back end of the sewing industry since I was 16. So I know when things were invented, why they were invented. I met people who invented things like the universal needle. You should be using a universal needle for quilting, not a sharp needle. Do not use sharp needles unless you want your fabric to fall apart. A girl in her 20s, when I was in my 20s, wrote a book and she said if I had just stopped, I had only this much space of white paper in my book and I didn't stop. I decided to share with you and she went to her attic and she printed out a, or started taking pictures of a quilt that was made over 100 years ago and all of the seams were shredding. And so she guessed, not really being in the sewing industry that long, never having any background in training, she was just a really great quilter, came up with some great designs, and everybody wanted to learn how she did it. So she wrote a book telling you how she did it. She guessed that all the seams were shredding because that person must have used 100% polyester thread over 100 years before. And that was 20 years or so before. Don't look like that. See, that's why she doesn't want anyone to know her name. So basically, she guessed that. Because all the seams were shredding, she figured that the cotton thread must be torn by the stronger polyester thread. But that's not true. This is 100% cotton fabric with 100% polyester thread in the needle and the bobbin. If you stretch this for a month, carry it around with you, you'll never tear the fabric. Because I sewed this with a universal light ball point needle. The universal light ball point needle is a ball point. And when he invented this needle, he was actually correcting the problem that our fabrics were shredding, but he didn't want to make 70 different needles, so he got all the sewing machine companies together and had them all engineer their sewing machines. So when the hook and the needle met, it was exactly the same. The Bernina sewing machine company didn't want to come along and change their engineering, so they engineered the needle for the Bernina, and all the other sewing machine companies at that time changed their engineering to match the Berninas. And that's when we got the universal needle, universal to all sewing machines not universal to all fabrics. But he didn't know he was going to invent another needle after that. So he never put light ball point on the needle and dealers were educated at the time to know that the H following 13705 stood for light ball point, which is why you see it also on the stretch needle, which is also a light ball point. So if you use a sharp needle, you're going back in time to why we used to use a 5 inch seam allowance. Why did we have a 5 inch seam allowance? Do you guys know? Most people forgot. I even had 15 educators and none of them could remember and they're all laughing. Well, I know I used to teach to do it, but I'm not sure why I taught to do it. And that was because we I used to have a sharp needle. I don't know why. <laughs> we used to sew right, wrong sides together instead of right and grade it down a quarter of an inch. And then you would wrap it around like this and spread it open for a French seam. And they still do that on blue jeans where it's real blue jean, not stretched, because they still use a sharp needle. So you want to go away from using the sharp needle whenever you're going to ever stretch or wear the garment. And then we go back to the thread. Why would you ever want to use cotton thread when you know that cotton batting in only one year is rotted and decayed to the point where you wouldn't ever want to use it? And when you have cotton thread, it rots in less than a year on the spool and it starts to break as you sew with it. If anything is breaking as you sew with it, it's also going to break on the garment or the quilt or anything that you're going to wear. It's kind of like that V8 moment. Oh my gosh, I should have known better than to use that. There's a new thread out. This is Wonderfill's Invisifil. And Invisifil thread is only 100 weight. Watch how it just floats really, really lightweight, and this thread has stretch to it. It's the only polyester thread with stretch. Go ahead and pass it around. This, one spool of this and one bobbin can quilt an entire queen-size quilt. This is equivalent to seven and a half spools of cotton thread. If you buy one box of it, which is on our table, it's equivalent to 48 spools of cotton quilting thread. It never breaks on you. It comes in 60 different colors, so you'll have a lot of fun with it. When we started quilting, quilt designs were engineered for you to start in the middle, but not for the reason you've been taught. They've been taught to start in the middle because mathematically they're engineered for you to start in the middle and work your way around and never stop. So you don't ever have to tie a knot because every time we tie a knot, we create a weak and vulnerable area on the surface of the quilt. 
So this is how quilt designs were created so that you don't have to think as you move around this circle. And when you're finished with this circle, you're done with the, with the panel and there is no need to tie any knots. With the octahoops, you can actually embroider right through the quilt. That's what you see where I've combined embroidery with quilting. This binding was done with a satin edge foot and that's why you can't see a stitch on the front or the back. And that I'll show you after this. The satin edge foot is our most popular product. The Octi Hoops is growing in popularity and here's an example of why. Those of you who've done quilting before know you usually are sitting in this position. And you try to get you try to get underneath the foot and look around. And if you wanted to quilt around these little flowers, you couldn't even do it because you can't see through the foot. And that's why I was de designing a new free motion quilting foot because even Gamel and Nolting's president had actually contacted me and asked if we could figure out how to make a foot you guys could see through because people were complaining about not being able to see through the foot. So when I would finally had the resources and the time to come out with a new foot, having been the inventor of the Creative Feet, I realized that it didn't work. No matter what I did, I couldn't make a foot that you couldn't see through. So then I started remembering what I used to teach. We never used a foot. The darning foot released in the 80s for darning socks and sweaters. That's why it's called darning foot originally. <laughs> then they came out with it for quilting because somebody got an idea of using it for quilting, not because it's a scientifically good idea. So the darning foot actually causes a problem. I have a question for you. If there's no puckers right here, how do they get there? You put them there, obviously. Right. <laughs> the foot causes the puckers. So the foot is actually tapping on the surface of the fabric. And then if you combine that with safety pins located throughout, that safety pin locks the fibers and it actually taps its way to create a pucker. That then forces you to do palms down, which is physically bad for you, to spread, and that's what causes you to square off the quilt after you've already cut everything really good and sewn everything good. So you'll never have to square off anything ever again. Part of what my father and I did when I was younger was we worked with uh, the hospitals within the Los Angeles area, the Braille Institute, the Institute for the Deaf, and other hospitals that did recreational therapy for people who lost the ability to go into the normal workforce because of an amputation or losing their sight or other issues. I had a woman come in with her left hand amputated as a result of a diabetic issue. She couldn't sew because the sewing machines all come out to the left, so she couldn't hold her hand on the fabric to help guide it. I had her take elastic straps like this and make little loops on the surface of the fabric. So she was able to do that a lot faster than me now. And you just put your arm through like that and she was able to sew as if it was a hand. So now you can do that with this and you're going to be able to quilt without being conscious of the quilt. It takes you into your right brain when quilting, which is something that I couldn't even do before. Until one day I'm sitting there quilting and the phone rang and I started to cry. I got misty because I was going to stop quilting. I never in my entire life ever thought that would ever happen to me. I've been sewing since I was nine. I have never felt like crying when I had to stop. So I had to stop and think about why I felt so good. And that's because I was in my right brain, which I knew you could do on embroidery, but wasn't sure we'd ever achieve it on quilting. Probably because we have so much money invested in, into the quilt. And there's a much more emotional connection with it. Taking place this bottom frame underneath here and it lifts the feed, the fabric above the feed dots that are going to be feeding at a two and a half millimeter stitch length. There's no foot needed to, to be used so I won't have to scrunch down which is physically damaging to your spine. Now we have this situation, we have a full size quilt and we want to move it around and normally I have to use a fusible batting to the top of the quilt. That's to lock the batting in place when it does tear underneath someone's tush as they sit on the bed and the fabric stretch and the batting is not the fabric so it tears. And this is true of all battings, they all tear. The least terrible of, <laughs> that's fine. <laughs> I just made a joke and distracted myself. The least terrible of all battings is the bamboo if you want to stay with a natural fiber. Bamboo batting has, uh, as it's in, in nature, it sways with the wind and has this flexibility to it. And it makes your fabrics drape better than if you use a non-stretchable non batting. And I have a sample in the booth, but I can't find it. So basically, we're going to decide where we want to quilt, because there's no rule anymore if there's no pucker. That means you can go ahead and buy all 60 colors of the wonderful thread. Tent, tent, no. <laughs> And you can go ahead and use one solid bobbin that matches the bobbin 
and then go ahead and change all of the change your thread to blue and do all the blue flowers on the whole surface at one time. Then go pink and do all your pink, purple, and dry purple. And instead of having to work in an un illogical manner of pushing your way out from the center, we're going to take and wear our quilt on both sides. Now, instinctively, we think how comfortable the quilt is to lay our arms on it would be very nice. And if you do that, you're not going to move the quilt. And this is the most common mistake people make. So it moves along with you unconsciously. It cannot not go where you want it to go. And the bottom frame is underneath, which has an uneven surface that doesn't stick to your sewing machine. And the two frames, even though they don't fit together, bring when brought to the corner, match and meet together, allowing us to move them as one without stretching the quilt. So you're never going to have a pucker. I've been trying for three and a half years to pucker something, and I can't get it to pucker. So I'm not scared at all to do this right in front of me. I'm going to take and drop the handle, and you're going to use your left hand. Left-handed people should have a table surface, but right-handed people don't need it. Those of you who haven't felt this before, go ahead and pass it around. And you'll notice it feels just like a crayon, kind of puts you in a juvenile state of mind. You start feeling already like you're having fun and you're doing something that's really not, uh, not grown up in its behavior. I'm going to take in, now we have just the free arm. Oh my gosh, you can't possibly quilt with only a free arm, but you can. Because remember the shape of the bottom frame, and it is just going to be hanging off the free arm like that until I bring it up to the inside corner of the tall, smaller one on top. Yep. And you, you would not have all that garbage underneath your area. You see Oh yeah. So we're going to take and excuse me. I said it looks like home. <laughs> Does it? Oh, that's bad. You should be cleaning your tables before you quilt. <laughs> do what I do. What I say, not what I do. Okay, so we're wearing the quilt. We now no longer have to think about it. We gotta grab our little handle, which I had, and now I've lost it. I'm, I'm right-handed, and that makes me learn slower than a left-handed person on this. But even though you're left-handed and you do things with your right side of your brain more than a right-handed person, you're still using your left side of your brain, even if you're a left-handed person, while trying to figure this out. And once you stop figuring it out, you'll start to feel a physical anomaly occur on your body. You will feel tingling on the back of your neck, a heat will occur, like a warm sensation, and this is when endorphins release as you switch from left hemisphere to right. Believe it or not, and I actually give you a warning in the middle, in the beginning of the video because I want you to know you're going to feel funny, so you don't think you are having a stroke or something. You'll literally start to feel like you had wine. <laughs> Serious. So, this is, see, you hear that sound? That's the sound of my machine warning me that I have not lowered my foot because there's no foot, you might accidentally do that. And if you forget to lower your foot, you'll get the bird's nest look of looping threads underneath. So you just tell yourself out loud, because your right brain needs you to speak out loud, say, I'm writing, I'm writing, and you will start moving your fingers rather than lifting your elbows and leaning. Because when you're writing, you have more control. When you're writing, you just move your fingers, correct? When you do any other sewing technique, they always have you lift your elbows and move it around. So when you are lifting your arms, it's like writing your name with both hands on the pen and elbows in the air. Could you write your name at all doing that? And remember, your fingers are deformed because you squeeze the pen. We don't have to squeeze this at all. So it's a very light touch. If you, when you first start using it, if it jerks, that's because you're pushing down, sister. My sister Kathy is learning right now by getting this about foot. So how we go like this? And you just start drawing. And there's no rule as to where you go if you're quilting, but if you're stippling, you now have a rule. What's the rule of stippling? Never cross over where you've already been. So uh, you won't even really have a hard time with that anymore at all because you're just drawing. And if you could draw a line on a piece of paper that never crosses over, then you can certainly do it on a piece of fabric that requires no pushing down. You'll even have more control than you do on your fabric or on your paper. I had a woman who's 92 years old and she said for the first time in all her years of quilting, she actually signed her name and she said, I saw a signature I haven't seen since I was a young girl. It was her young woman's signature. Because what you envision in your mind is what you can achieve if you don't have to push down and squeeze that pen. So you'll have more control. Now this is me doing everything wrong. There's no stabilizing of the quilt. Um, you've been taught something about when you break needles. What causes needle breakage? What? Pulling against it. Pulling against what? Your needle. 
Actually, yes. If you lower your needle and use needle down operation where you push the button and it always stops down, you'll break a lot of needles. Because when you stop, so I'll quilt for a little bit. When you stop and you have to go answer the phone or go to the door, you let go and your quilt does this. Now you can zoom in on this. So basically, there is a, the needle's up and the thread is being pulled. Now if your needle was lowered, the hopping foot does not hold the fabric, your needle is now being bent underneath the sewing, underneath the fabric. Okay, now you can pull up. So basically, the, when you don't use a foot, the feed dogs or the uh, tensionists are holding the thread so you don't have to worry about getting up and going away. We never taught to ever lower the needle on every motion. Because you can see where you are, you don't have to lower the needle when you stop. Those of you who feel that compulsion to lower your needle will find it really interesting how suddenly you stop feeling the need. I have people call me up and the number one question asked is why are all my stitches the same? And I say, are you asking why mine are or why yours are? And I say, why aren't mine, meaning theirs? They can't figure out why their own stitches are the same. And they're, they're doing a better job than they did when they had a stitch regulator on. And the reason is because your right brain becomes your stitch regulator. The right brain is the smart side of your brain and it knows how fast to move your hands based on how fast you're running the machine. Now I'm moving my way down and to prove that you're moving your hands faster than the machine is running will not break the needle, I'm at zero speed and I move my fabric that far and my needle did not break. You can do this all day long and all you get is a big sloppy looking sock. It will never break your needle by moving your hands faster than the machine is running. So these are the octa hoops and this is why we've been almost constantly sold out for the last three and a half years because now you sew with elbows down, resting, and you feel good, and they allow you to free motion quilt and embroider on every sewing machine that can do free motion embroidery and quilting. I'm not even going to be afraid to show you the back of this quilt because I have yet to get puckers, even if I tried to get puckers. These are my ginger nippers, which I absolutely love. And I'm going to cut my bobbin thread, even though this machine has scissors, because my machine got damaged from Homeland Security opening up the machine when I wasn't there. I couldn't, I couldn't figure out how to put it back together. I opened up the machine, put it on, and my, tension, or my needle threader went and fell out. So this is, even though this was not stabilized in any way, I can make all the way down on both the back and the top, for those of you who walked up after I started. There's no pucker on the front or the back. And if anyone would like to look at this, of course. So these elastic straps is why I was able to not have to hold it. And it did embroidery as well as quilting. Now I'm going to show the satin edge foot. I invented the satin edge foot for a woman who's blind and deaf. When I was working once again with hospitals doing recreational therapy. And uh, she wanted to sew all by herself. You can cut it now. <coughs> Kathy already knows. 